This is the first in a series of videos about demythologizing quantum theory. You may ask why quantum theory needs to be demythologized, and the answer is that there are many quantum myths. For example, wave-particle duality, the idea that quanta are both waves and particles. Quantum randomness, the idea that quantum theory is intrinsically random, that causality does not apply to it. The idea of collapse on awareness, that the results of our observation depend on the act of awareness and not on physical processes. Schrodinger's cat, the idea that a cat can be both alive and dead at one and the same time if we don't observe it. The many worlds interpretation, the idea that every time an observation occurs in quantum theory, the world splits into many new worlds, one for each possible result of the observation. And finally, non-locality, the idea that there is some sort of spooky communication between objects at a distance, a communication which violates causality. In this video, we're going to be discussing wave-particle duality in light. The Greek atomists theorized that all things, including light, were made of indivisible particles they called atoma. They supposed light atoms to travel in straight lines after an initial shove. The controversy over whether light is a particle or a wave began when Aristotle rejected their conjecture and hypothesized that light is a disturbance of the transparent medium. The first observations falsifying the particle theory were made by the Italian Jesuit Francesco Grimaldi in the 17th century. Grimaldi made a careful study of the shadows cast by sharp edges. He observed that shadows were larger than they would be if light traveled in straight lines. Moreover, their edges were fringed by colored bands, a phenomenon later explained by Fennell using the wave theory. Despite Grimaldi's observations and Newton's own discovery of another phenomenon, Newton's rings shown here, Isaac Newton slowed the progress of science by parroting the atomist's claim that light was made of corpuscles. In the 19th century, the weight of evidence finally crushed the particle theory. Early in the century, Thomas Young predicted that waves passing through two slits would cause an interference pattern. He then showed that light produced exactly the predicted pattern. This is how Young's experiment works. Light passes through two slits. As a result, it creates two sets of waves radiating out in cylinders centered on each slit. When the waves strike the screen on the opposite side, there are positions at which the waves reinforce each other and positions at which the waves cancel. The result is a distinctive interference pattern, a pattern of light and dark bands that can only be produced by waves. In the 1860s, the Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell consolidated the experimental findings on electricity and magnetism in his electromagnetic theory and predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves that would propagate at the observed speed of light. Then, in the 1880s, Heinrich Hertz confirmed Maxwell's theory experimentally making it settled physics that light consisted of electromagnetic waves described by Maxwell's equations. So the matter rested until Max Planck published his research on black body radiation. Black body radiation is the scientific name for the light that heated things such as lava emit. It's called black body radiation to distinguish the universal thermal glow from any color particular to a material. Note that the color of hot lava varies. This is a reflection of the variations in its temperature. 
Here we see how the glow emitted by a black object changes as its temperature increases. The problem for physicists was to predict the character of the emitted light as a function of temperature. Black body radiation was not a hot topic in 19th century physics, but it was of interest to electric companies. They paid Max Planck to develop a theory of black body radiation. Some theoretical work had been done based on classical physics, namely Newton's mechanics and Maxwell's electrodynamics. Unfortunately, the classical predictions disagreed with observations. Planck worked on the problem for six years, meeting only frustration. Finally, in late 1900, he decided to try a mathematical trick for which he had and offered no justification. He knew from Maxwell's theory that radiation was caused by oscillating electric charges. Physicists assumed that the oscillating charges could have any amount of energy, but that assumption always failed. Planck's mathematical gimmick was to assume that the oscillators could only have discrete energy values. Then the energy would be emitted in discrete energy packets. Planck's gimmick gave him the equation for black body radiation that matched the data. Later, the discrete bunches of energy emitted by atoms would be called quanta, or photons. The next step in the development of quantum theory was the investigation of the photoelectric effect. It occurs when light shining on a metal surface causes the ejection of electrons. The mystery was that the ejection of electrons does not depend on the energetic intensity of the light beam, but on its color. For long wavelength light, such as red, no ejections occur. As the waves get shorter and bluer, eventually we come to a wavelength at which ejection starts. After that, the ejected electrons become more energetic as the wavelength of light gets shorter. The intensity of the light only determines how many electrons will be ejected, if any. In 1905, Albert Einstein solved the photoelectric effect riddle by hypothesizing that light was composed of the photons emitted in blackbody radiation. Neither Planck nor Einstein showed that light was made of particles, only that it is emitted and absorbed in packets with discrete values of energy. Why this was so remained a mystery for years. Nevertheless, Einstein was adamant that light was composed of photons. The problem was that in 1905, no one suspected that electrons have wave properties. We now know that quantum physics does not imply that light is composed of quanta. In 1968, Willis Lamb and Marlon Scully showed that the photoelectric effect is compatible with Maxwell's theory once we recognize that the energy of atomic electrons is quantized. Let's turn to another phenomenon that is used to argue that light is really made of particles. Namely, that the two-slit interference in Young's experiment is not a smoothly developing continuous pattern, but has little spots. These spots are supposed to show the impact of light particles. While this line of argument is convincing, if we do not think about it, once we do, we can easily see how fallacious it is. Let's look at a couple of pictures many of you are familiar with. Here is the aftermath of the Tunguska event. And here is the effect of the explosion of Mount St. Helens. What do these events have to do with wave-particle duality? Each event shows the interaction of a shock wave with discrete objects, namely the trees in a forest. Forests are made of trees, and it is because of the discrete trees in the forest that we see discrete effects of the shock waves in our disasters. In the same way, matter is made of discrete atoms, and it is because of the discrete atoms that we see the pattern of dots in the interference pattern of Young's experiment. Next time, I'll demythologize wave-particle duality and matter. Thank you.